door. Um, oh, it should be fine. I just say, it should be fine. Really, um, I don't have, uh, next week I'll be a little bit more prepared. I'll have more handouts as well. Uh, but even the handouts don't have all the verses. So what we're going to try to do is at least have all the verses in front of us as we continue to go through our study on the kingdom. Uh, let's let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Father, your word is important and your purposes are vital. That we It's, it's vital that we understand your purposes. Uh, you will be glorified in time and history, and we want to be a part of that and not a hindrance to it. May our study in eschatology uh, be a means toward that end. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Quick review. Uh, our first week we talked about the importance of understanding God's purposes in history. He is, he is the author of history. He is created the beginning and the end. He has got an end in mind. So at the beginning, he started, and we're going to work towards his end. Regardless, uh, we use the example of uh, planning a picnic. We decide uh, that we're going to do a picnic, and that purpose more or less predestines phone calls, visits to the supermarket and the, and the uh, grocery store so that we will uh, find ourselves on the day of the picnic prepared to have our picnic. That's a, just a, a thumbnail idea of what God has, has in mind here uh, with predestination. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah. God has predestined that uh, his son's kingdom will be brought to fruition. Uh, but if we need to understand that as theology is a study of last things, uh, we are, there are many, many last things throughout history, but God's planned all of those things. All, lots of things have beginnings and ends. Our lives, our sentences, our church services, all of it. At beginnings and ends, so in a very real sense, history is nothing but a study of eschatology, the study of last things, the study of facts, and how we got there. Um, one of the most important things that we can understand is that God's one of the primary purposes in God's uh, decrees is that Christ's kingdom will be consummated, and so we are working our way through. Uh, a study of the kingdom of God as put forth by the International Church Council Project. Uh, they use a firm deny format in their in their articles to give us very little wiggle room. Uh, we affirm this, we deny that, so that there's no misunderstanding of what exactly it is that's being talked about. Uh, we went through the first two articles, so I'll just back up here. First article last week uh, that we talked about was uh, the kingdom, and I'll just put this up here. Uh, hopefully, you brought your uh, you had a uh, handout. I will have more handouts next week. Um, I concentrated on this stuff. Oh, I'm done, and didn't actually print out additional handouts uh, for today. <laughs> we we went through the article uh, one that we're affirming that. God is king of the universe. Jesus Christ, uh, did, Jesus Christ's advent did not suspend God's, uh, the trying God's sovereign rule, but that there's always been a kingdom. It's always been God's kingdom. There will always be God's kingdom. We went through the, the uh, verses uh, one at a time on that. We went through Article 2. Defining the uh, the kingdom, affirming that the kingdom of God can be talked about as the universal rule of Christ. It can be talked as uh, about as the special saving rule of Christ, the life, wisdom, holiness, power, and authority that Christ grants to His people, or the permeating influence of the Word and Spirit in the world. But denying that the term kingdom of God refers only to the providential rule 
and that Christ's rule and realm are limited to the church. Vital that we understand. Very important. Christ, is, as Joel said in his sermon today, Christ is king of everyone, whether or not they recognize him. That's important. Um, we did get into a little bit of a discussion last week about Satan's rule versus or Satan's kingdom uh, and Christ's kingdom. Well, yeah, Christ rules all. Satan is a usurper. He is, he's in rebellion with many millions of people in rebellion against Christ's rule. But with the advent of Christ and his, and his uh, victory at, at Calvary over death, they, it's been declared now the gates of hell, the gates of the kingdom of hell, the gates of the kingdom of Satan will not prevail against Christ and his kingdom. We are now redeemed. We now have the ability to follow Christ's commandments, God's commandments. And by following those commandments, we will overcome the kingdom of Satan, the usurper. So that's what we that's where we left things uh, last week. And so let's start with article number three. I have these things printed for myself. Article 3, the purpose and the fall of man. One last proviso here. I just, oh, we're going through this with a fine tooth comb because of the importance of understanding God's purpose in, in the kingdom. So we are going to, we're going to hammer every, every verse that the, the uh, International Church Council Project put out in support of these various uh, articles. And uh, so it, it may seem lengthy, and we're going we're, we're gonna to take as much time as we need. And I want to be interrupted as we go. If there are questions as we go, please shoot up a hand. Don't let me, don't, don't let me get past it. Let's, let's talk about it. So Article 3, the purpose of fallen man, we affirm, A, that God purposed from the beginning to share his rule over earth with man. It was part of his original plan. Before time, before creation, God created man in his own image and endowed man with faculties for ruling the earth. God, in the creation mandate, commissioned man to rule the earth and granted him delegated authority to fulfill this commission. And D, man, by God's design, was made to be the highest created being in the universe because he's the only creature that bears God's image. This is something we talked about in the introductory course, is that because man is created in God's image, there's a different end for man than there is for creation because man rules over creation. That's the design, the dominion mandate. We deny that man's fall into sin eradicates the image of God in man. Uh, we deny, B, that the fall eliminates or reduces man's responsibility or mandate for exercising dominion under God over the earth. We deny that all mankind, the righteous or wicked, or wicked, ever cease to be responsible to live under the rule of God in grateful obedience to him as Lord and King in every area of life. So this is, this is important to understand why we're here, what the purpose was, the creation man. We are to rule with Christ over all of God's creation. And in verses in support of this, begin with Genesis 1, 27 to 30. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female. A very familiar passage. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, so do it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I've given you every herb, bearing seed which is on the face of the earth, and every tree which is the fruit of the tree, which is <clears throat> in which the fruit is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for me. And every beast of the earth, and every fowl of the air, and everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for me, and it was so. Which is, of course, a support for that uh, God created man in his own image. Deuteronomy 4, 5 and 8. I've taught you 
the statutes, the judgments. And whenever we see that word behold, we, we really have to take note. God is saying, hey, everybody, pay attention. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgment, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land, whether you go to possess it. Keep, therefore, and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes, and say, surely, this great nation is wise in understanding people. For what nation is there so great who have God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? Perhaps the original verse uh, authorizing missions or missionary evangelistic verse because by noting about the statutes and follow, by following the statutes, people will look and say, we want to be like that. This is winsome. This is, this, this is where winsomeness comes from, is being a great nation by following God's statutes. But again, it goes back to that rule. God purposed to rule with his people, with his saints. And so, here we have it. If we follow the statutes and judgments, by following them, we become rulers. Psalm 8, again, very familiar passage. What is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man, that thou visitest him? And thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, hast crowned him with glory and honor, thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and beasts of the fields, fowl of the air, fish of the sea, and whatsoever path passeth through the paths of the sea. Psalm 8 is very interesting in that these things are talking about both Christ and man. Psalm 8 is a messianic psalm, but it's also uh, applicable to us, made in God's image. So this really ties together that idea that we are ruling with Christ, and that was the original purpose. Here we have it in Psalm 8. Romans. <clears throat> Tough stuff. Got your question. Yeah, sorry. No, sorry, I was actually going to bring up Psalm 8 because um, when you say that man is the highest created being in the universe, are you talking, like, just for clarification, are you talking about the physical universe? Because I was going to bring up Psalm 8 as well as Hebrews 2 7, which, which both of them say that man is a little lower than angels. So if you could just maybe speak to that, clarify that. Yeah, he's made a little lower than the angels. I think that that. Uh, I think that verse set is really actually talking about Christ temporarily and during his advent. Didn't have the same power that the angels have at that time. And yet, mankind is the highest created order in the universe. And the angels don't, don't yet even understand it. These are the things into which angels long to look. Well, why would God save men who sin? There's no salvation for the fallen angels. And so uh, an angel is a very powerful being. They move tremendously fast, you know, through things and appear in different ways, uh, do a lot of things that men cannot do. And yet, God's purpose for mankind makes that purpose makes him the highest order. When we get into when we get into the ideas of imputation, which you've heard me go on about, we impute value to things. And we all, we all understand that. I carry these two coins around, these two silver coins. This one is very, very worn, an old silver dollar that my dad carried around all his adult life. This one's just a piece of pure silver. This actually is, is in, in weight worth a lot more than this is in terms of silver. And yet, I wouldn't part with this one because it has great sentimental value to me. I'm imputing value to this coin. I give this coin that value. If somebody found these two on the street, they might kick this one into a can someplace and go for melt value at a later time. But this, you know, has a higher value. They would impute different values. Men impute differently. But God has imputed to men the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
God being the imputer, imputing Christ's righteousness to men, necessarily makes men higher than the angels, ultimately. The highest order of creation. I, so, I hope that answers the question that you were asking. Sort of. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think, I think it's a, yeah, on the technicality, I think so. I mean, I think as far as actually, it's as their order has created, um, initial creation without imputation of Christ's righteousness to man, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. Except I that don't have a problem with what you're saying as far as, yeah, I mean, having imputed to man the same seat and being the heir of all things. Um, in that sense, I don't have a problem with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, so it's a, it's a matter of semantics, I suppose. In a sense. In what time you look at it. In what time you look at it, but then also what was God's purpose from the beginning? And at the beginning, that was always the purpose. So, I don't know how to really get around it. We did talk about, in the first week, this idea that history is important. It's not unimportant what happens from the beginning to the end. Um, and I use that example of how I kind of flippantly said, somebody asked me, how long have you been a Christian? And I said, oh, since before the foundations of the earth. Well, yeah, God had that initial purpose in mind. But it's important that I only became a Christian when I was born. It's, it's important that I lived as a pagan and that I recognize that, repent of that. I can't just flippantly say, well, I've always been a Christian, so I don't really have to worry about it. No. It, it's a, what actually happens in time is important. And that's, I think, where you're getting at. Yeah, that's, yeah. History, it, it does have an importance, and we have to take a look at history and say, what's God doing here? And how is he using this time and this event to further his purposes? But I think when we take the statement that man is created as the highest order of the universe, we have to take a big global view uh, from, the, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Romans here, we get into uh, we get into some wrath. Uh, the wrath of God revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Seth, I'll always be beholden to you for your teaching about Cambodia, how you went there and said, you know, we're not starting with trying to prove God. We're starting with the point that you guys understand this, but you are suppressing this truth in unrighteousness. Uh, whenever I read that, I think of that Sunday school lesson. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it to them. For the invisible things uh, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, even this is his eternal power, and God had, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was dark. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made to, uh, made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor in their own bodies between themselves. Wherefore God also gave them up to the uncleanness and the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, to change the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So uh, here we have here we have a verse uh, talking about the idea that men cannot escape that men, regardless of whether or not they recognize him, uh, they, they are responsible to live under the rule of God in grateful obedience to him as we had in the, um, right here in that state. It's, uh, it's pretty clear that we, no one can escape, no, one's, no one gets, gets passed. I don't believe in I don't believe in God. Well, it's, it's a matter. God's still there. So, Romans uh, 2, 6 to 12, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in, in 
well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, on every soul of man that doeth evil, Jew first and also of Gentile. Glory, honor, and peace to every man that doeth good, to the Jew first, also to the Gentile, for there is no respect in persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. As many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Same point. Everybody's responsible to obey the law. Uh, point being, too, that it doesn't matter if you're Jewish, it doesn't matter if you're Gentile. It's, uh, this applies to everybody. In and out, in, inside and outside of the church. So, there's no, no place to, uh, there's no place to hide. Um, Philippians 2, 9 11, and through 11, wherefore God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. That the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Again, everybody's responsible. Uh, Hebrews. 1, 13 and 14, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? Again, get back to the idea that man's highest created order. Uh, Hebrews, again, uh, 2, 6 through 8, but on a certain place testified, saying, what is man? It's a rehash of Psalm 8, it's brought back to us in the New Testament as well. Uh, or son of man that thou visitest him, thou made him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of the hands. Now here, this is where I was saying that Psalm 8 is talking about Christ in one sense, and this is where we, we pull that from, more, more so than the Psalm, but by interprets itself. So, um, the writer of Hebrews here is making the point that Christ is higher than the angels, which a lot of the, the Hebrews had a tendency to have some angel worship. And then last, uh, Revelation 1.5, and from Jesus Christ, <clears throat> who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, and him that loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood. Christ is king of all. He's king of the prince is, he's the prince of the kings of the earth, so there's, a, there's no denying that the, that the scriptures support Christ's kingship overall. Article 4, Inauguration of the Kingdom. We affirm that, that the New Testament phase of the kingdom of God was inaugurated in fact in history at Jesus' first coming to earth, and that it now operates, now operates in reality and power among men in this present age. We deny that the church must await the second coming of Christ for the kingdom of God to be inaugurated on earth in time, space, reality, and power. That, that ends up being a relatively controversial denial in, in a lot of churches. Um, you just, you heard this yesterday. Um, that was out with some uh, an old acquaintance, and somebody was telling her that, well, Christ isn't king yet. Well, yeah, he's king. He's, he controls everybody. He's, Satan's the king. Satan's the king now. That whole dualism thing. You know. But the kingdom, the New Testament phase of the kingdom, started as... Yes. Where, where did that come from, that thought that Satan is king now? When did that start? Was that always a prevalent thought? Certainly in the in the, in the dispensational and, and the premillennial types of uh, churches, they're they're pulling it from New Testament. I don't know about Old Testament thinking on Satan ruling. I believe that God was. So, so you can go back as far as you can go back as far as the early church. I mean, that's what a lot of some of the earliest Gnostics believe that 
Only the spirit was of God, and all the flesh was of the devil, that he ruled all things fleshly and earthly, and it was actually almost a good thing if you wanted to off yourself, because it would release you into, into spirit. I think that's some of the roots of that concept, that everything in the world is the devil and the evil. Well, that's the, the dualism of Hellenism, the, 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 the Greek thought right. of uh, dualism, that flesh and, and creation and material is evil and only the spiritual, which derives from the Platonic ideas, all the back to Plato, that forms are the only pure, uh, pure anything. It's the forms are the thoughts, they're the ideals, they're the idea. And, and Plato abstracted everything so that uh, anything here, people or things, even just plain objects, are, are only imperfect representations, shadows, as you, if, if you will, shadows of the ideal. And so that we can only attain to perfection in the spiritual, in the spiritual form. Um, and I didn't mean to imply that <clears throat> the only premillennial thought, because there was premillennial thought even early on, third or fourth century, uh, we had pre some premillennial teaching uh, that was more or less uh, overridden by creeds as the creeds were developed. Uh, but, uh, but I don't know about Old Testament thinking on, on Satan being the ruler of this world. I, I can't recall any. Joel, do you, are you aware of what is Satan no, kingdom? You're talking, you're talking Old Testament? Or? Old Testament. Yeah, Satan really is not talked about that much in the Old, Old Testament, really. Um, it, it seems like in the modern the modern era, to answer the question and to address it, with with our emphasis, shall we, if not obsession, I guess I should say with, with emphasis on Revelation, Book of Revelation, Satan is, is so active in that book that it seems like we couldn't help but get books like Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. That that type of a that type of a thing. Um, it seems to me we had sort of a combination of a, of, 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 of a dropping out of society at one point and an obsession with what's going to happen in this great drama that we that we have nothing to do with. And that you know that we like a, and that, that was explained to me that way a lot of times. There's this great drama going on in heaven. It's going to happen later on. It's really had nothing to do with you right now. And at that point, then, what's happening now? Well, Jesus is going to act and overcome Satan by the book of Revelation, and then it's, that's later. It's definitely not now. Well, who, who's that leading charge now? And uh, it seems like that's a, a uh, emphasis by, by some, at least, who have the skill in, in, in selling books. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I believe there's a lot of people don't really quite believe it that way. Mm -hmm. But the books seem to get sell, sold on that point right there. This, this grand thing that's going to happen towards the end that we'll observe sort of from a distance that we're not involved in. We also have the... I, I believe the root of the error lies in Gnosticism, but dispensationalism makes it much easier to fall into Gnosticism. It's systematized. Yeah. Um, there's also um, there's this idea from uh, uh, that um, no, it's in John when Christ talks about my kingdom was of this world. You know when he was in, with uh, Pilate. That that tends to lend to it, but we also have. You know, the prince of the power of the air, and Satan was given a certain authority. Here, not authority, wrong word. He's given a certain power. Yeah. Um, and his deceptions are, are quite real. Martin Luther was, was quite correct in telling Earth is it's not his equal. Satan's a pretty, pretty bright guy. Pretty powerful, but not omnipotent, 
uh, omniscient, uh, omnipresent, one of the omnis. Uh, I was thinking of your story, but uh, omniscient versus on, oh, you mean omnipresent? Uh, for later time, sorry. Yes? Didn't Christ say the kingdom of God is within you? Kingdom of God is within us. Right. In other say. words, yeah. So it would be the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God. Christ is building the kingdom through the people right. that He has here. We've been recruited by Christ into His army, into His kingdom. If we're in His army, if, if we believe that He's the Lord, then we are in His army. We are His subjects. And the only way we can do that is if the Holy Spirit has changed us and changed our, our, our values, changed our imputations. We impute more value now to the things of God than we impute to the things of this world. And so, there's a very real sense that the kingdom is in us. But it's not only in us. The kingdom is here because we're here. His, his recruits are here, his army is here, and we are overcoming the fruits of darkness, so to speak, with the, the fruits of light, with, with the fruits of the kingdom. So, it's, uh, there are, there is a, a very real battle going on, that's what we talk about every Sunday, it's about the fight. We're fighting, we're fighting the civil government who has arrogated and usurped authority unto itself that it has no legitimate claim on. Uh, we're fighting we're fighting the, the abortion movement. Right now we're going to be fighting the homosexual movement. And we'll be fighting the next movement that the civil government decides that they're going to redefine in favor of and permit. Well, the government permission of of these things is no more legitimate than any anybody walking down the street saying that, well, I can murder someone. Well, says who? Says who is the big deal. What's right, what's wrong? It says who. We have to go to the Bible for these things. So as we go to the Bible, we will spread the kingdom. That's the that's the point of our study here. What the kingdom is to look like. It's, it's to look like something real here and now and not just live in our minds in, in complete abstraction that gets into that idea that Greek thought of only the spiritual is is the good we have to put it into practice and put it put action to it and that's that's what that's what our study here is about the kingdom is making it real So we'll start, we'll start with Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Uh, For unto us a child is born, so is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, and Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. On the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And we read this every Christmas. And we know that we're talking about Jesus Christ. And about his advent. The child is born. But do we ever really think about the importance of the rest of this verse? The government shall be upon his shoulder. The government of what? The government of everything. The government of us as individuals. The government of the church. The government of the civil sphere. It's all on his shoulders. Well, what does that mean? That means that all the government is supposed to conform to his law and his precept. That's what government is. We govern ourselves according to what's right and wrong. That's the definition of law. So God has given us his law, and, and it's going to be on Christ's shoulders. 
and he's wonderful, and he's the counselor, and he's mighty God, the everlasting Father, hearts of peace. And what about this? The increase of his government, there, and peace, there shall be no end. It doesn't ever diminish. It doesn't get less. It looks like it's getting less. It's getting less in America. But in a global sense, is it, is it becoming less or is it becoming more? Well, this says, there shall be no end. If we believe this, and, the, and the, it, especially this part of the increase, it's getting better in an overall sense. We're fighting it right now, but we have no idea what God's purposes are for tomorrow. Uh, when I study, and we'll, we'll get to this book, uh, I study through the book uh, that Ian Murray wrote called uh, Puritan Hope. The, the hope that the Puritans had was all about revival. It was, it's an astonishing couple of chapters in, in that book where he talks about the, the absolute uh, universal derision that Christianity was held in in England in the 1730s. Uh, visitors from France to England would note that the only time anybody brought up uh, Christianity, the Bible, or God was to laugh about it. It was a joke and everybody knew it. Everybody understood that Christianity was a fiction. God poured out on England and Scotland and in America at that very time, starting in the 1730s, mid-1730s and into the mid-1740s, an astonishing revival. To the point where in, in 1830, or I'm sorry, 1730, everybody just laughed about it and understood it was a joke. Ten years later, there were 20,000 people standing in a field in the rain to hear preachers. People were hanging out of church windows. People had been hanging out our windows here just to catch a couple of, of words out of the scripture and some application. An astonishing revival from a time of astonishing apostasy. We don't know if we're not on the verge of that with these recent rulings, with what's going on. We look around at, uh, at house churches, at little churches like this. Nobody knows we, we exist. Nobody knows about us. Uh, Joel and, and Seth and Ryan visited a, a conference in or is it Tucson or Phoenix uh, some, some months ago? And, you know, they ran into dozens of guys who have churches just like ours that nobody knows about. God is preparing hearts, and we never know. We never know what his remnant is. So we, we have to think about the increase of his government and his kingdom as ongoing. Because the Bible promises that. I'm not watching my time. Thank you. Uh, boy, we've got a lot to go through on this. Um, any questions on this? I'm going to I think I'd like to stop here because, and start here again next week. Uh, because we've got a lot, a lot of verses here. Full two pages yet. Uh, to go through uh, on this. So, I'll, any questions, comments, discussion to any fights, any arguments? <laughs> anything, anybody. Oh, thank you, Sid. I'm giving Not a fight. Uh, <laughs> um, in, in a culture that is strongly influenced by the EPA and Everybody wants to save the planet. Those. And we, we're talking about a dominion mandate um, ruling over this world. Um, the EPA sets out regulations. Um, the city of Wales people talk about recycling and, and all these practical ways of doing that. Practically speaking, what does it mean for us to take dominion over the world? It's stewardship. It's a stewardship issue. Uh, do you take, we are to use the tools. Uh, and the resources that God has given us on this planet to develop godly institutions, godly families, godly civil government, uh, and, and in a sense, beautify 
and create what to God's glory and towards the ends of his kingdom instead of our own glory and our own profit. He'll, he'll profit us as we go. We have those promises in Deuteronomy. Uh, it just, it always, it, it always um, thrills me when I read in Deuteronomy 28 that his blessings will overtake us. I just love that term, where that his blessings will overtake us. If we only obey his commands, the idea that he has to, he has to chase us with blessings it just fascinates me. What does that mean about how we live in this life? How we, we're running away from his blessings, even when we're following his precepts. That we do have rebellious and stubborn and stiff-necked hearts. Uh, that he has to chase us down with blessings. Uh, but yeah, there is there is godly stewardship, godly environmentalism. Uh, it, it's been pointed out that the, the least of the commandments, the least of the commandments, uh, is that, at least as far as the rabbis uh, were concerned, was uh, if you come across a bird's nest that has fallen out of, the, out of its nest, what do you do with that? And you pick that nest up and you restore it. You can have the eggs, but you, you still restore the, the nest to, to the bird. That's, a, that's, talking, that's an environmentalistic, it's a preservation of the species kind of a command. That was considered the least of the commandments, but yet, by the, by the rabbis. And yet, that very commandment also carries with it the same promise as obey your mother and father, so that your days may be long in the land. On the least of the commandments. So you book in the commandments that your days may be long in the land. They're, pretty, they're all pretty important. So it, it's it's out there. So, so things like taming animals that a lot of environmentalists would say humans should never try to control animals. Yeah. That's not out of line, scripturally speaking. It's not out of line. Um, there's there's some interesting ideas, however, uh, as depending upon how far you go with your post-millennial thought. There's the idea that as we begin to truly follow all the commands, and as the world conforms itself to God's commands, that the promises in Isaiah 65 are, will actually come to pass, that the, that the lion will lie down with the lamb, and that the, they'll actually eat straw, or you know they'll eat, eat grass, and not be carnivores anymore. We were given meat and cultivation of animals after Noah, after Blood. Um, but uh, it wasn't always so. At the beginning, we just read that the herbs were given to us as food. So as we more and more and more conform in this life to God's commands, it may very well be that God is promising us that, that nature itself will be redeemed and changed. And, and so that may, that may, there may be change there as well in cultivation of animals and for what purpose. Oh, okay. I was going to say, most every uh, governmental institution that we have right now is of a satanic nature, and environmentalism has to do with um, putting nature yes. above human kind and and um, really destroying the. Yes. And the, yeah. and, and, the and the environment. We will idolize either the creation, nature, or we will idolize time and history. And one or the other, it, it ends up being one or the other, uh, that we will derive our meaning from within history. That there's a historical purpose and we can trace it all out. So we find our idol in time or we find it in nature, both of which are God's creation, right. of course. Rather than finding it in God. So, yeah. All right. Oh, uh, Seth. Go ahead. Go That's ahead. a contentious one. You don't have to answer. It could be a yes or no. I think I already know your answer. I would not, ar I would not argue that, that all of these verses should be read with a post millennial understanding. Do you believe that they all have to be read with a theonomic lens, though, on top of that? Theonomy is nothing more than the idea that God's law. Is the law. Theonomy. Theos. Theos. So it's God's law 
So yeah, I, I, I firmly believe that God's law supersedes all, all law. Uh, the quote in today's bulletin uh, uh, it pertains to this. The rule of law for nearly 1,500 years in Western civilization was God's law. Over the last 100 years, rebellious men have undermined this fact. There is now no objective standard for the rule of, God, of law as God's law has been discarded. Hence, the state now thinks it gets to make up law all by itself and make it whatever they wish. And as one can detect, things are not going well. God's law. So yeah, I, I have come to understand that all law should be God's law and that civil government is here to administer it, not make it. We're here as, as dads and moms and families to administer God's law. We're not to make it up any more than the church is. So, yeah, everything, I, I do try to bring everything to the theme is that contentious? Oh no, I just, I mean that would be, you know, I think that's some of the differences out there. Is I, can, I can read these passages very clearly with a post-millennial lens that doesn't take me to all of the same places because of a more lowercase t theonomic view than, yeah. you know, that's why I asked. Yeah, okay. I think it's helpful to distinguish the person. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's pray and we'll uh, Father, well, we thank you for the, the time that you've given us and this fellowship. We thank, thank you for this teaching time. Pray that, uh, pray that the words that we speak here and teach here and discuss here are in conformity to your thoughts and your words. Pray that as we swerve outside of that, that you would uh, discard those things and make them very clearly not of you. We pray, too, that you would dismiss us with your blessing and that your blessings would overtake us in the coming week. And we thank you for that, Christ. Amen.